uh, I am here to chat about postseason and uh, what's going on. So I'm going to be live on two different platforms. I'm going to have the restream going on, and uh, we're going to be talking shop with all of you. So if you guys are here and you have postseason questions, I want to hear them. I like to answer them, and uh, maybe you guys can give me some new ideas. So uh, we're going to go live on Instagram and on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitch. All right. So if you're here, we're going to talk post season, post season for beach volleyball. Now, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about what to do, how to reset themselves for playing. Um, and what should you do after the season's over? After it's finished. So uh, if anybody out there on Instagram has any questions about postseason, I want you to post them and then I'll help answer them. I'm going to be here for about 20, 25 minutes uh, just to hang out with you guys and answer all your questions. So go ahead and use the chat, use the script, and let's talk postseason. A lot of players right now, go ahead and, and ask your questions on your own. <laughs> yes, let's get better, Ray Ray. Uh, postseason. Match is just finished. Tournament's just finished. We're probably at peak condition, but a little bit run down. So what comes next? You know, how do you reset your goals and start planning for next season? And what should you do? Should you refresh mentally? Should you refresh physically? Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. And I see you out there, uh, the vib 3 zy asking what the best workout for explosiveness is. And we'll get into that. So the first thing that you want to do after postseason is really just kind of take notes. Write down in your book, somewhere where you're going to look, write down what you did well this season. That's a big start. Understanding the things that went well so that you can grab onto them next year, right? So that you can accentuate all of those things. Also, you want to take a look at what went wrong. Like, what did you consistently fail at? The only way that we can know stuff like this is a little bit about statistics, right? If you're not taking statistics, you're not looking at some of your videos, you're not going to know exactly where you went wrong. I'm going to be honest, most of us probably, <laughs> where your first like source of blame goes, you usually get disappointed in yourself because there's really only one team that wins the championship at the end of the year. And sometimes that team is still disappointed in their entire season, right? Um, they didn't feel like they could be at their best. So the first thing that people turn to is start like blaming partners. You start looking and you're like, man, can I get a better partner for next year? And that's the wrong way to think about it okay if you finish the season and your first thought is how do i get a new partner you're skipping a lot of your controllable problems a lot of your controllable issues right the first thing you have to do and i'm learning this in uh, relationship counseling and, and marriage counseling right now like the first place you have to look is at yourself right take a look and see what did i do wrong what can i bring better what can i do more consistently uh, that's going to make me a strong teammate no matter what team i'm on no matter who my partner is that's huge okay so we have to understand that first that we're looking at ourselves and we're taking statistics and we went pretty deep into this with my beach volleyball mastery uh group yesterday and we talked about what statistics we want to take Okay. So can anyone out there who's looking on Instagram, who's looking on Facebook and on YouTube, uh, tell me some important statistics. Use the chat and go ahead and tell me some important stats that are meaningful in beach volleyball. Go ahead and write them in. I want to see what you guys recognize as an important stat that you have to pay attention to if you want to start upgrading your game. Okay. Or if you want to help your players out. Okay, beach volleyball helps a lot with being a great communicator. Yes, it does. Uh, but first, let's talk about just the stats that we want to take and pay attention to. Kills, Volley Tim, you wrote kills. I like that. 
but how many kills, right? How many kills? How do you measure that? Because if you get a hundred kills, but you made a hundred errors, you know, you're, you're not, uh, you're providing zero for your team, right? You're net zero. So just measuring aces, just counting. Okay. Nice. Uh, okay. Chris, you wrote measuring aces, measuring kills. So we can't just keep numbers on these. What we have to do is Charlie had a great answer. Charlie Gunsky, thanks for, for jumping in there. Service error ratios. Okay. So let's look at percentages. Statistics come in our percentages. Okay. Not just good passes, not just kills, not just aces, but how many attempts do I have and how efficient am I being? Okay. So let's just look at side out percentage side out percentage is going to be a very big thing if you and if you're looking at um like world tour medal winning teams you're going to be close to 70 percent seven out of ten side outs and what is a side out ratio anybody out there tell me what a side out ratio is or a side out percentage this is different than attacking percentage remember it's really different than attacking percentage okay side out percentage nobody all right all right all right i'll answer i'll answer okay so side out percentage when our team gets served what percentage of the time do we win that point okay that's going to be different uh for each individual player but it's also going to be uh for a team so you have a team side out percentage and you have an individual side out percentage right so let's just say that we get served and uh, we get served 10 times and we win seven of those points, right? So our side out percentage is 70%, right? No matter what happens, because there's only one win or lose, right? So we're at 70%. Again, that's different than attacking. That's different than hitting percentage, okay? So side out percentage. That is also now we have to go partner by partner, right? So you look at yourself again, postseason. we're looking at ourselves. We're looking at what statistics we can measure. How did we finish this year? Okay. When I get served, what is our team side out percentage? When I get served or when my partner gets served, there's a little bit of a difference. And I was uh, using Nick Lucena as a, as an example. And something that's like really good about nick is he does not have the highest attack percentage like by far he doesn't have the the, the highest hitting percentage but his team's side out percentage is big right so what does that mean that means that nick has an offensive style where he puts the other team in just enough trouble just often enough he doesn't make errors and then he puts himself into a better position maybe for phil to get a block maybe for him to dig and then convert again but Nick doesn't make errors, right? He puts the other team in just enough trouble. And yes, it's a great side out player, but he's not top of the AVP or FIVB ever, right? So his side out or yeah, his side out percentage is still high because of how much trouble he puts the other team into. Okay. Um, and you want to measure both of those. So here's something actionable that you guys can do. All right. Hopefully, you guys have filmed all of your matches, right? In our beach volleyball mastery group, uh, my private coaching group, we make sure that you guys are filming everything. You film every match, you film every practice so that we can look and we can analyze it. But if you're doing this on your own, make sure that you're filming matches, okay? And then take, it doesn't matter how many you take, you want to get as you know, big a statistical set as possible. Um, but you have to say, every time I got served this year, did we side out? How many times did you get served this year? And how many of those points did your team win? And that's how you get your side out percentage. And that's important. Okay. So um, that's, that's what we're going to talk about side out percentage and attacking percentage today. We'll just dive into that. All right. Uh, Wolf, greetings from Munich. Thanks, buddy. Hi, Lexi. Good to see you. And Aaron A, best angle to film. Aaron, um, probably the best angle to film if you're like filming your match, and that's a good kind of question, is when you're back middle of the court, okay, back middle and kind of as high up as possible so that you can see where you are. Um, 
on that court. So back middle, always if possible, right? You usually don't want to be from the side as little like corner angle as possible, but back middle and try to get it high up if you can. Like from the ground, certain things get in the way, um, objects on the beach get in the way and you can't film. So high up directly the back middle of the court. Okay, probably about 15 feet off the court, five meters off the court. So now that you guys have your side out percentage, what's next? You know, okay, every time you got served, you know, you won 40% of those points, 50% of those points, right? If when you get served, your team wins less than half of those points, there's not a whole lot to blame except for yourself. <laughs> now, yes, you can say like, all right, well, I never got a set. Eh, yeah, that's where we get into attack percentage. Okay, so side out percentage and attack percentage. Once you have the side out percentage, how many times you got served and how many of those times did you, your team, win that point? Once you have that number, then you can start diving into like some whys, right? Were you most of your points that you lost? Did they come from errors? Did they come from blocks? Did they come from doubles by your partners? Were there a bunch of shanks? Like, did you get aced? Okay. You have to start being subjective and honest with yourself. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to hitting percentage because this becomes really, really, really important. Uh, AVP, FIVB, when you guys are winning, if you're winning these tournaments, your side out percentage, your, sorry, you're attacking, you're hitting percentage, hitting efficiency, if you want to call it that. Uh, that's when we take total number of attempts, right, over. So if you got served 10 times, and then you take the times you got a kill, and you subtract all of the times you got an error. Now, an error counts as hitting into the net, hitting out of bounds, or getting blocked, okay? Those are all hitting errors. So you take your kills and you subtract your errors. So if I got or if I uh, got to attack 10 times, right? And I made, uh, let's say seven kills and three errors. So I take those seven kills, I subtract the three errors. So now I'm positive four, right? So I got four good things, good results, out of those 10 swings. So now I'm 40%, right? That's not enough to win a tournament um, uh, at the AVP or at the FIVB level, right? A 400 or a 40% hitting efficiency is not enough. You're probably gonna need to be around 500 or 600%. But where do you need to be based on what level you are is very different. Because I'm gonna tell you guys right now, right? Um, can you guys just use the chat and tell me how many players are below playing tournaments underneath double A? Right, right now we have uh, 40 people watching. So how many of you, just like raise a hand or use an exclamation point, type it into your chat. How many of you are playing tournaments below the double A level? Anybody? Okay, definitely me. Good response. All right. Um, we got at least one. So at least one person's playing below the double A level, right? That's not, you don't need to be siding out at 60%, 50%. If you look at any B, A, and usually double A tournaments, there are so many attacking errors, right? People hit into the net, they hit out of bounds, the partners can't get a good set. So then you start looking at, okay, you know what? The average B or A tournament, the attacking percentage or the attacking efficiency is somewhere like 20%, right? Because they need to get kills frequently and we need to control the ball. So if another team's attacking me and like the average attacking percentage around me is 20%, guess what? That means that if I just keep the ball off of the ground and I put it in, on the other side, I'm going to win that tournament because that means that 80% of the time I'm getting the ball, right? They're only getting kills 20% of the time. Now I just need to take care of my side. So if you're a B player or an A player right now, my number one piece of advice is 
stop going for kills. Now, I know that sounds kind of wacky, but too many people, right? You're getting a, a, a mediocre pass, a decent set so that you can kind of jump, but you're probably going for too many kills on swings that you shouldn't. Maybe you don't have the physicality because you're not up here above the net and you're still trying to hit really hard. That's not going to work. Okay. Maybe you, um, you also don't have the physicality if you're off balance and now everything is lower. Okay. You're early, the setter's out of rhythm and you're still trying to think like, I got to hit this hard because I got to get a kill. You don't have to get a kill. You have to put the other team into trouble. Once you put them into trouble, then your job again is to keep the ball alive on your side. And if they're only attacking at 20%, you're set. Your job is just to be fast, keep the ball alive, keep the ball up. And when you attack, know your good spots on the court. What are good spots on the court? If there are no blockers, short middle, deep, fast middle. Okay. Those are great high percentage areas of the court. If you have a really good cut shot, you can use that. I don't recommend the straight um the straight short shot so if somebody peels there's no one there and it's right in front of you right so you're lined up with this person and you just think it's straight short that's gonna be tough because they only have one plane of movement to go on you want them to like come forward and move to the side so that they're going to be struggling a little bit more middles usually help if you hit to the middle both of these players freeze there's something instinctually where they think the other person has a chance of getting it so they slow down so if you're playing a B, A tournament, this is how you win. Do not make hitting errors. Do not make hitting errors. Keep the ball live on your side. If you don't get the perfect set, don't go for your hardest swing. Don't go for something that's like near a line or, or like the sharpest possible cut. Think about where you want to hit it first. Deep middle, short middle, cut shot. You don't want to hit generic hard cross because you're going to hit somebody in the chest and then they're, they're going to have a chance of getting it up. You want to make people move, especially at these, at these levels. Okay. B, A, even double A in some places. Make them move and keep the ball in and you'll win tournaments. All right. So you want to look at your attacking percentage because as soon as if you get one kill and one error and eight continuation balls, right, you're hitting zero. But if they're attacking at uh, 20%, then you're going to win more of those points. You have a better chance, 80% chance that you're getting that ball back. That's pretty good. Okay. So just make sure that you guys aren't going for big kills. So we got side out percentage. When you get served, does your team win the point? Figure that out before you start building your off-season plan. Okay. That's what you need to discover. You should be discovering it all the time throughout the season, but now is a great time to look back and reflect. How often are you siding out? Okay. Then, yeah, let's start measuring your partner. When your partner, if you played with one person, if they uh, got served, what was your team side out percentage? Okay. Match by match, you can measure this. Set by set, you can measure this. And if you played a season with a bunch of different partners, then you can start honestly and objectively looking to see are you the weak, weak link, right? Because if you're always like a lower side out percentage and then you've played with five different partners and you just blame all of them for being bad setters, but somehow when they get served, you guys side out, right? It might not be because they're a bad setter. It might be because you're an irresponsible hitter. Okay. And then we talk about attacking percentage, right? Um, or hitting efficiency. That's also what you have to figure out. You have to know how many times you attacked, then you have to take how many kills you got, okay, and you subtract how many errors. And if somebody gives you a bad set and you make a hitting error, that's your fault, okay? Don't, don't go in there with an ego of like, well, what was I supposed to do? I got a bad set. When you get a bad set, your job is to keep it in short middle, deep middle, make the other team work for their, their next point. Do not give away free points. Um, and then we can start kind of physically assessing right so right now um my group what we're in we're in the setting portion uh of of our year in the beach volleyball mastery group online we have uh nine months of courses and 
what I'm kind of after right now is trying to get a few B and A players. And what I want to do is see if in this offseason we can take you to a double A level. So if you guys are interested in that, get in touch with me. Uh, make sure you send me a message and I'll tell you all about the Beach Volleyball Mastery Group. But we have an entire offseason to look at your last season, figure out where you need the fixes, and then create a season designed for you. And that starts now. So it's postseason. Get your numbers. Get your side out percentage. Get your attacking percentage, your efficiency, right? And then let's start looking at some other things. Yes, you can look at passing, but those are the generic things. Once you're looking at your side out percentage and once you're looking at your hitting efficiency, then you're going to start to see like, oh, all right, well, every time I had a bad pass or a pass off the net or every time like my partner was setting me from the back of the court, I made an error. Then you know where you need to fix, where you either need to be better or more careful with your swing selection. Okay. So I hope that makes sense for you. Let's, let's move on to like physically what we want to do. First thing you guys, like, yeah, if you're here and if you're listening and you want some homework and you want something to do because it's off season, just sit down, watch a match, take a look. And every time you get served, make an etch. And every time you win the point, make another etch. And then you'll start finding those stats. Okay. Super important. If you're going to talk physically, be honest with yourself. Did you feel slow? Did you feel explosive? Were you getting tired uh, at the end of matches? Were you really crap in the morning? Did you fire up better in the evening? Did you lose like all of your first matches, but then you're able to find a rhythm, right? You, you have to be self-aware. So there's a lot of questions that you need to ask yourself at the end of the season so you can prepare for the next season, okay? And if you're crap in the morning, you have to figure out how to be excellent in the morning, okay? You have to be able to win that first match. So part of your next season, growing into your next season is going to be saying, all right, well, I struggled in morning games, so I'm going to wake up early and that's where I'm going to get my first lift. I'm going to train my body to be able to fire first thing in the morning. I'm going to learn a real warm up so that I can bring it on the first match. You don't want to give those things up. Okay. Uh, you also have to start taking care of imbalances. So directly off season, you could rest, you could let your brain relax, chill out for a little while, like get back to the rest of life. Yes, there's more to life than volleyball, but you want to just breathe, relax, and then say, all right, what do I need? physically what hurts okay you can see that like my neck i know it's weird my neck is kind of tilted right so i've got a couple chiropractor appointments coming up right i know that this side of me kind of pulls me okay my uh qls over here my lats everything gets tight and it even pulls my neck so a big part of my next couple weeks now that we're kind of done with the season it wasn't a long season but kind of done with the season going to be opening up this side and opening up this side to rebalance myself get those latch stretches get those hip stretches right you can't be in off season if you if you pumped through your season like you worked out hard you practiced and you played these tournaments you can't just go right into heavy lifting again because right now is the time to set your foundation your foundation is rebalancing everything making sure that you're just as strong on one side as you are on the other but you have to start with slow, controlled movements in rehab style. If you guys have ever been to physical therapy, like that is the pace that you want to be moving right now to rebalance yourself, wake up things that are being ignored. Remember, uh, volleyball is an explosive sport. So anytime you're like hitting hard, there are little imbalances that your body wants to make it easier to move in those. And you have to hunt those things down and figure out where you need to be. So if you've got shoulder pain, next two, three weeks, at least, you're doing a lot of external rotation, right? You're doing slow, controlled band work. Uh, if you want one from the 60 Day Max Vertical, we have a 60 Day Max Vertical program. You can get it in our membership uh, or you can get it on your own as a standalone product. But if you get one of those, we take the first two weeks and that's just called like awakening. We call that the awakening section of our lifting program. And it takes you through all of that rehab protocol so that you can find all of those like little weaknesses and you start to discover like, man, is my right arm weaker than my left? Is my left weaker than my right? Um, am I able to balance on one side longer than the other? 
we do that all in the first two weeks of 60 day max vertical. So um, if you want, again, send me a message and I will be able to uh, steer you to that program and talk to you all about it. So right after postseason, right after your season's done, rehab protocol. You shouldn't be lifting heavy right away. You shouldn't keep exploding. That's not the time. This is the time to rebalance everything. Okay. And there's a few different theories that come along after that, right? What you want to do is you want to build max strength over the season eventually. Okay. You have to build max strength. How much force can you develop? And then how quick can you move it? Okay. How much force can you develop? How quick can you move it? So eventually we'll get back up to moving things fast, but first you have to move them controlled. So what I recommend is going a lot lighter through all of your normal um your physical routines like if you're bench if you're a volleyball player you're not bench so let's just call it a squat right so if you're squatting yes you might be able to bounce to the bottom and fire through but are you strong and balanced and controlled the entire way through okay some people can jump higher when they get a lot deeper but if you maybe can get higher when you jump deeper or like you squat deeper then Maybe you're too off balance once you're down there. So maybe you're leaving something on the table by being weak at a certain part of your squat. So a big recommendation that I have is slow down, explode up, right? Take a little 10 second squat down, eight, seven, six. This is with weight on your back if you want, or it could be body weight, five, four. See if you can get all the way to the bottom. See if you can go ass to grass, right? And get, get those butts down and get some depth if your hips allow for it. If they don't allow for it and you feel tightness stopping you, well, then we know what your goal is for the first four weeks of postseason, right? But I recommend right now going through rehab protocol and seeing at what points in your squats, at what points in your strength moves, you kind of give out or fatigue. In order to do that, you want to go lighter weight, and I want you to move really in slow motion through each section of each lift. If you can do that for two or three weeks, You'll start padding all of those like hidden weaknesses that are at a certain range for you. And then you're going to be able to be more mobile, strong in more positions, and you'll be able to um, jump higher, hit harder next season, right? But if you can't control all of your weight all the way down into a squat, I'm saying all the way down, then you're not going to be able to explode as much as you want, and you're not going to be able to balance when you need it. So you can't like shift block, make that move, and then come up strong because there'll be little wiggles and there'll be little weaknesses in there, okay? So we're going through rehab protocol and we're going through slow down, fast up, right? Try a 10 second eccentric with light weight and then explode up. And you'll see where you get uncomfortable. And if you get uncomfortable, stay there. You have time until next season. You have time, but right now you have to put in the work to lay the foundation. Okay, lay the foundation for this entire season, and then you can start packing on strength. Some of you might need a little extra size. I'm not saying up here, but maybe you need a little bit more room. So in the 60 day max vertical program, we take you through a hypertrophy cycle, short hypertrophy cycle, where you add a little bit of muscle, you create that space, and then you start working on max strength, which means less reps, more sets, and uh, heavier weight, right? But we're always trying, <coughs> Once you're balanced, we're always trying to move things fast up because volleyball should be an explosive sport. Excuse me. <coughs> so that's your postseason work. Get your side out percentage. Get your attacking efficiency. Write those stats down. Write down any situations where you think, man, I make more errors in transition or I make more errors in side out. All right? Start figuring those things out and write down today what went well what went poorly this season so that you know you can walk on day one of practice and be like this is what i'm going to focus on today day one of practice next season that's what you're going to focus on if you're in the mastery group um if you want to be a part of that you can join me and we'll work on that together we'll look at all of your old film we do two meetings a week where we look at your film and then we show you where you can get better and i guarantee that we can get you more points without you ever practicing. I know that sounds wild, but we'll look at where you're making errors. We'll expose you to those ideas and say like, hey, in transition, just be more responsible. 
and I'm talking from like my own errors because I know that my hitting percentage, like most people, drops in transition, but mine used to drop like a lot, a lot compared to my uh, serve receive attacking percentage. So I just learned like, all right, well, I've got a, a few swings, certain things that I do in transition, and I have more options uh, in my serve receive side out, but I know that I'm minimizing errors in transition, and that has upped my hitting percentage in a big way the last two years, short two years, but last two years. All right, so go ahead, go and get those uh, stats, and then if you guys have any questions, I uh, don't have too much battery left. Uh, let me see if I can plug you in Instagram. <laughs> see if we can get you guys going. Okay. Yeah. Nice. All right. Instagram, we plugged in, so we got that. Okay. So let's now like get into any questions that you guys have. Right. We talked about rebalancing, doing some rehab protocol, um, and going slow, 10 second drops uh, into an explode up to find out where you're imbalanced, where you're weak, where you're stopping, if your mobility is an issue. So now let's, I'm going to go through the chat and start asking some questions uh, on, let's go YouTube and Facebook first. All right, all right, all right. Mark, sorry to hear you're healing from two broken fingers, man. That's rough, but you've got a big opportunity to do a bunch of slow rehab protocol. So uh, I always look at injuries as an opportunity to discover other imbalances. So Mark, uh, go and figure out where your imbalance broken fingers do not prevent you from doing squats, do not prevent you from doing sprints, um, lunges, anything like that. So I recommend that you start discovering your lower body imbalances. Uh, K Wombo, do you think this advice would stunt growth? though. What do you mean, Kay Wombo? Uh, can you write another one? Do I think this advice would stump growth? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Logan Weber says there is no off season. BS, bro. <laughs> Take a rest, get yourself recovered. Uh, we know this from lifting. We know this from actually like intellectuals. Uh, your brain acts like a muscle as well, that when you have periods of rest, you come back stronger and you're more efficient over time. Okay. More efficient over time. Uh, if you don't take rests, you're more likely to get hurt. And when you get hurt, you're done for eight weeks. Why not take a one week rest and never take that eight weeks off in a row? Right. And then you can uh, be stronger in the long run. I used to be very much of that mentality, like no off season, go hard all the time. And I paid the price in a lot of injuries. Right. Now, I'm really efficient and probably stronger and healthier than I've ever been because I take more rest. I wish I would have, but you know, no one, no one sat me down as a young and said, sit down, recover, make sure that that, that you know that that's an important part of what you're doing. Cause you'll last longer. Okay. Um, Aaron, you said we don't win enough points against top teams. They just get everything. Just still stay patient with yourself, Aaron. Figure out like what you're getting dug on. So do you get dug more on hard cross and hard driven? Um, when you hit shots, are you more efficient? Start looking at your old videos and figuring those things out. If you haven't taken videos, that's how you start. If you didn't take videos this season, you don't have a whole lot to build off of because all of that is your own personal view instead of a subjective view. All right. Uh, Wolf Schultz, my partner is always crying about you don't get the attacks and then he focuses on the own attacks. Um, not sure. I'm sorry your partner's crying. <laughs> Greedix, I have a question for you. I'm 5'5", five, five, and I know you might say I'm too small to hit, but I jump really high and I can hit in three meter, but I have an issue with my timing and I think it's due to my height. Uh, your timing is an issue with timing. So Greedix, if I'm understanding your question right, like 5'5 five, five is fine. Go ahead. And if you can get up and bang, you get up and bang. Uh, there are angles that some people have that other people don't. But when you see Phil Donhauser go up and hit inside half court on the sideline, you see Tri Bourne hit that like extreme sharp cross in the front third of the court. Not everybody has that attacking range. So one of the things that you have to do when you're figuring out what type of offense you play is find a player who you like, you're physically like, you have the same qualities or at least similar qualities 
and say what works for them and why what's their shot selection okay if somebody's jumping 12 18 inches higher than you you can't emulate their same swings so you can't bang <clears throat> hit inside half court it's just not going to work okay you have to find somebody who physically represents you and then figure out all right now i've got at least a model that i can work from but if you're paying attention to phil and andy mole and that's who you're modeling your game after when you're five five and you have a 20 inch vertical you're you're looking at the wrong model for yourself because you're not going to use the same tactics that they do all right that would be like <laughs> i don't know uh if you're a samurai swordsman that's a thing uh and you just like you went into war after studying a bunch of people who were fighting who were fighting each other with machine guns right that's not going to work you're not going to learn from them because sword battle versus gun battle is very different if that makes any sense weird weird metaphor but i think you guys get it find somebody you can model after you and then do that um and if you have trouble with your timing uh greedix and you're struggling with that i want you to jump in at, to our beach volleyball mastery program where you can take the two month side out and win tournaments course. And then you can take the three week, uh, 21 day fix your arm swing. So you can fix your arm swing in 21 days. That's one of our courses. And then we have the two month you, these are self-directed. You have the videos, you have all the homework. We give you all the drills that you can do at home or on a court. You can take those and that's three months plus all of the video work with us twice a week. And we'll get your timing there. Okay. Um, I, sorry, I can't come down to Huntington Beach, Jason. <laughs> Greedick says, I feel like I always need to jump as high as I can all the time, and I have a hard time timing it. Any advice on how to fix my timing? Yeah, Greedick, I can't, I can't look at you right now and say, how do you fix your timing? The one base that we can say is make sure that your first step of your approach is at the same point of your setter's contact every time. So if you're having trouble timing things, it usually means that you're varying your timing okay and that means that you're starting at different times so one of the things that we always recommend is when the setter is contacting the ball once their hands go that's when i'm going to place my first step of my approach onto the ground and then i can see the ball and then take left right left but once you start your approach that just doesn't mean that like okay there's a set piece of timing now and i have to go and continue that approach every step of my approach is controlled one then i see the ball go up but i'm still moving in slow motion where is it okay now i take my left step to the ball and then i finish pop pop right all this happens in motion so it's not like you're like step pause and hold step where is it okay and then close you have to do it controlling each portion of a single step and that's hard to do but if you're having trouble with your timing Number one, sign up for Beach Volleyball Mastery. We'll help you. Number two, make sure that you're starting at the same point on your setter contact. Place your right foot on the ground. For me, I take a little bit of a higher set. I always place my left foot on the ground just as the setter is contacting the ball. And then I take four steps after that. So I kind of have a five-step approach. Okay? But you have to start at the same time in order to start developing that timing. I hope that helps. Hmm. Talking real fast. Sorry, guys. My game falls off a cliff towards the end of a tournament. I need to get fitter. Aaron, you can get fitter or you can eat better and drink better. Um, the people in our 60 AMX vertical program, they get a full nutrition plan for eating before the tournament, eating during the tournament, and eating after the tournament. So if you're ever interested in that nutrition plan, you'd sign up for the 60 day AMX vertical program. And we have that full eating plan and nutrition challenge for you. Um, let me know and you can you can dm me or, or send me a message and i'll talk to you about that but a lot of problems at the end of tournaments come with really poor nutrition because people don't know what they should be eating lots of carbs lots of carbs all day long and a little bit of protein um and the right carbs good fast carbs okay but uh it can do with conditioning or it can do with nutrition you got to figure that out and first thing we have to do is write down everything that you eat during tournaments uh bolser you need some stretching and flexibility those things are huge man um k wombo uh does bench pressing hurt volleyball play here's the thing about bench pressing okay it's 
<laughs> for volleyball players, what is it going to do for you? Well, a stronger pec, okay. A stronger pec might help you fire a little bit faster. Might, right? Not a ton, just a little bit. But think about all the time that you're gonna dedicate to this motion. Boom, boom. You're putting a little bit of pressure uh, on your shoulder joints and is that necessary for you? Because if you're like trying to go max bench press, would you ever need to be a max bench press if you're a volleyball player? No, you need quick pops, right? So body weight, explosive ones, lightweight with dumbbells firing quickly, but you don't need to go heavy. And if you're spending time and you're dedicating a significant amount of time throughout your year to bench pressing, don't you think that there's something more closely that resembles volleyball that you can do with that time? Like, Squats, lunges, a little bit of core work, protecting your shoulders, strengthening yourself up here using some band work or using a, like Turkish get ups or something. Right? There's so much more that you can do with other exercises that is not bench pressing. So if you're going like every time you go into upper body uh, as a volleyball player and you're just benching, 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 that doesn't make sense. You need a little bit, but you don't need to bulk up and you definitely don't need max strength out of your chest okay so it's kind of yeah we all like to look pretty dudes <laughs> right out there it's nice to have good, good pecs but you can get those through body weight push-ups and just don't dedicate a bunch of time okay so bench press kind of nix it unless you're uh, going after a certain look but just know that it's taking away time from other exercises okay uh zach miller what's the best way to keep up to keep from messing up timing and switching back and forth between indoor and beach. My off season is spent playing indoor. Yeah, Zach, I do the same thing. So I used to switch between indoor and beach and it's always tough to come back and figure out what, um, where your time is. Cause usually indoor is like a much faster timing. So going back to indoor, we all have timing steps and I'll go back to that. Like indoor has timing steps. If you're running a fast or a hut, or a go to the outside, you're probably on your second step of your approach and already firing, okay? If you're in beach and you're playing a high ball set, then your first step, your right step, is going to be on or just after set contact, right? It takes a lot of patience. Everybody battles with being early. So you need to be comfortable seeing a ball in the air, not necessarily being in motion, but then gaining quickness and going to it. The stronger you are, the quicker you are, the better you will be able to time balls. And that might sound weird, but if you're strong and you're fast, you can catch up to things and that allows you to do things. If you can only move at a certain speed, right? And you've got a serious ceiling, it's gonna be really difficult for you to change your timing because you can't add on to that quickness. So hope that helps as a question, Zach. Um, just try to develop your timing step and that's gonna be big. Joe L. Any advice for practicing hand setting at home? I always end up bump setting because I'm not super confident with my hands yet. Joel, we are currently, if you jump in right now to Beach Volleyball Mastery, first of all, betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching. That's where you want to check it out. Betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching. Right now, we're going through our 30-day setting course. So if you sign up right now, first of all, you get two weeks for free, right? So that's four meetings with a coach where we can actually analyze your setting. Yes, we're going to work with you on video and look at your touch, see what you're doing <clears throat> and be able to fix it and say, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do pumps. Like all of our players right now are doing, sorry. Yeah. All of our players right now are doing pumps. So they have a hundred of these a day, reverse pumps, not even sets yet, but trying to find that drop in your hands to develop that receive portion of your set. So our players right now are doing a hundred of those per day. If you join that program, you have two weeks for free. So it's two weeks free. That's like half of the program, right? And you can see all the videos that we give to our players and all of the at-home drills. So if you wanna work on your setting, now is a great time to start. Um, and our players have a hundred of those and they also have 600 other touches that they're responsible for every day. So. Um, Go ahead, and if you want to ask me about that, just shoot me a DM. All right. What would your approach be to dealing with cramping a lot near semis or finals? Yeah, 
Uh, <clears throat> for me, Jordan, when it comes to cramping, pickle juice. I like, first of all, eat well, eat lots of carbs, drink, have Gatorade, the type with sugar in it throughout the day. Don't like pound it, but kind of supplement it and sip on it through the day. So you always have some form of carbs and electrolytes as a steady influx. But for me personally, and for a lot of people I know, pickles and pickle juice are absolutely the only thing that help you out. Um, I don't know why. I gave it to my dad when he was like 65 after his entire adult life suffering from cramps. Now every day, like he does not stay in a place uh, with a fridge that doesn't have pickle juice in it uh, because it just helps with cramps. And we've looked for the studies. There's a lot of guesses for like what, what causes or prevents cramps. And people don't really know with certainty what, why pickles help. There are ideas and theories, but nothing like proven as like, yeah, this definitely works. Um, so Joe L, I'm going to try to find the page for you, but if you look at betterbeach.com forward slash coaching, that's the entire program and that's where you want to be. But I think not better at beach.com forward slash how to set in volleyball. Nope, how to set a volleyball probably. Okay. Yeah, okay. So this will tell you a little bit more about our program. Joe, I'm just putting it into the chat. I hope you can see it, but it's better at beach.com forward slash how to set a volleyball. Okay. Um, some of it, it won't post. I just tried to post it, but better at beach.com forward slash how to set a volleyball. And then when you want to sign up for the program, it's uh, better at beach.com forward slash coaching. And like I said, right now we're going through the 30 day setting course. So. Thanks. Yeah, Jordan, pickle juice is gross, <laughs> but eat well throughout the day. Make sure you're carving up. Make sure you have a steady influx of carbohydrates, easy, simple carbohydrates, which means like the sugar, Gatorade, lots of fruit throughout the day to keep yourself going. Don't chug it all at once. You have to graze so that your uh, glucose levels don't spike and then drop and spike and then drop. You want to just keep it as a steady influx. So steady carving throughout the day will help you. Drinking lots of water, of course, will help you. And for me personally, with cramping, chugging pickle juice. <laughs> it makes your stomach rough. So I would say like one shot of pickle juice after every match is going to help you. So we got a few people here who are on Instagram. And I'm going to go through these and uh, see where we're at. Okay. Summary notes. Ask the grass squats. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Hitting efficiency and side out efficiency are big. Uh, do you have any advice for those of us 50 and older working on their jump? Yes. By the time you're 50, your body's got a lot of ingrained pathways that you want to see if they're good or if they're bad pathways. So the number one thing that you should be doing is first an assessment. If you have somebody who can watch your movement, right? Like a great personal trainer, I'm not talking about the personal trainers who do the one month or two months certification. I'm talking somebody like with an education who went to school for exercise science, kinesiology, somebody who's like a doctor in physical therapy, somebody who can really dedicate themselves to analyzing your movements. Okay. And then you'll start getting an idea, but mobility programs. And again, the first two weeks of 60 day max vertical, we do um, just almost exclusively mobility and rehab, right? That's what you want to do first access all of the ranges of motion that you need to be strong, that you need to be fast. And that takes about 16, 17 minutes a day. My mobility program is 16, 17 minutes a day. I do it before every single lift, every single lift and every single practice, I go through the same mobility program. Um, and that's going to be the important thing. The next thing you have to develop is a little bit, little bit of hypertrophy and then start lifting heavier, faster. Right? There's, there's no one that this is not really going to work with. As you get older, after 35, 40, your strength levels will start naturally going down. Like you're not going to all of a sudden do that. But that's not your strength level. That's your capacity. You can still max out on your capacity 
at any age. So your programs would be really similar, right? You just have to know where your body is, how to balance it. So you need an analysis. You need to do all of that mobility work so that you can access it better. And a lot of the people in, in my program, I know I'm talking about a lot, but a lot of the people in my program within the first four weeks, they've already gained three or four inches of vertical leap. And why does this happen? It's not because like, well, we do have a really good formula, but it's because they're accessing their bodies. They're waking it up and forcing you to move and forcing you to get into different ranges. Finally, like, oh man, now I'm tapping into a different strength and a different range that allows me to summon more strength and more speed. So um, my recommendations for somebody 50 or older aren't really far off of somebody who's 20 years old, right? Make sure that you don't have imbalances, get yourself analyzed, um, have somebody look at you, and then start with mobility and flexibility and balance, and then build up your strength until you get to a max strength for wherever you are. But follow a program and don't overreach. You don't wanna waste eight weeks being hurt, okay? Rest is great, absolutely. Do you have suggestions for being stronger on offense in transition? Uh, Mike Quiro, if you're still here, uh, I do have some suggestions for being stronger on offense in transition. Here's one of the secrets that I like to use. Have your favorite swings selected before the match starts and before the point starts, right? And what you're most comfortable doing in all of your situations, it's okay if you're good at two things or three, you don't need to be good at five or six or seven swings, right? But if you're if you have a great hard cross ball, do it. Swing hard cross. That should be your default. If you're ever getting into like an error or you're in a slump, right? You got a lot of errors. Check with yourself and say, what's the last time that I did my best swing? My best swing, regardless of what the other team is doing. Because you got to default to what you're doing great, what you have the capability of to do excellent, and you need to go for that. So uh, when it comes to transition, say the ball's like I'm a right side and the ball's coming from the back left, what two swings do I know are always available? For me, I don't like the cut shot there because I'm already in trouble and uh, the other team's going to come back on too. I really like high deep seam, high deep seam, right? Like it just kind of quick slap. And high line, work. All swings work, all right? But it's we make errors when we cycle through like the nine different options that you have. So if you're in transition and you want to up your hitting percentage, pick two swings. Two swings that you do when you're in transition and that I, I can promise you that's going to increase your hitting efficiency, okay? And stick to it. Cool. My hero, I, uh, you heard that. So um, take a look at your favorite swings, the ones you know you're good at. And if you look at a set, so if you film a set and you go back and you had like nine different types of attacks, you don't have an offensive strategy. And now you're playing, you're playing like checkers. Like you're having a slugfest instead of strategizing. You should know what you're good at and establish those. Then what's your second best swing? Hopefully it's the counter of your first swing, right? So um, yeah, hopefully it's the counter of your first swing and uh, you can stick with that. But if you're, if you're going up to swing thinking that you can hit high line, hit short poke, hit a cut shot, hit sharp cross, hit high deep cross, hit seam, hit jumbo, you, that's too many decisions to make in that small moment. You should be choosing from three swings at every moment and that's it. Okay, try to apply that and see if it helps. All right, Jordan, going back into the other one. What should I do for shoulder plane inflammation? Can't hit the ball. Okay, um, a Brazilian in America. What should I do for shoulder pain? Uh, we do cover, we have a pretty extensive shoulder program in our programs, so uh, in our beach volleyball mastery program. So if you want to check that out, that's there. Aside from that, go to a physical therapist if you have shoulder pain let them figure it out and give you good exercises to do but don't just sit there because it's going to keep creating imbalances the more you try to protect it or alter your swing to get out of that pain the more you're going to start using pathways that are terrible for you 
and will lead to other injuries. So if you have something like pain, and this is what there's like a rumor, I'll ask Hayden about it, but there's a rumor that like when he feels a tweak or when he feels like sniffles, he stops practice, he goes and he sees his trainer and his body worker, right? And he attacks it immediately. He's like, no, I'm not going to sit there and pile through like a little imbalance. I'm going to make sure that I'm getting after it. And that's why he's got a long career. Um, but don't just keep playing through it. There's lots of shoulder rehab routines, right? And don't keep swinging through it thinking that like your body will find a pathway because that'll lead to another injury aside from that one and a bad pathway that you're going to have to uncover um, eventually anyway or redo anyway. So go see a therapist, physical therapist, and see if they can help you and give you a series of exercises. All right. Jordan had the opportunity to train with John Hyden often. At 48, he would tell you nutrition and stretching and mobility are more important for him to stay competitive. Yes. Thank you for backing me up there. We just recently tried to use so many deceptive plays and are winning more points against teams, against the top teams, running three and four blocks. Okay, setting over on two, hitting on two, back setting, jump setting, and it's a lot more fun. Yeah, deceptive plays are fun. Just make sure that you're measuring them. So if that's going to be your style of offense, Aaron, measure it so that you know it's effective, right? That's when it's probably going to turn into like side out percentage for you. So then you can start seeing like, okay, we ran a trick play here. I'm going to have two columns, my trick plays and my like kind of up and down generic um, offense, and then see where your hitting percentage is, where your hitting efficiency is. Okay. Um, Zach Miller, I got a how, but I can't see the rest. Beach volleyball is chess, not checkers. King Kong is not phenomenal. All right, guys. Um, that's it. I'm not getting any more questions. So I hope that helps. Uh, and I hope you guys have gotten something from this. Uh, just so you know, our camps are ready to rock. They're on sale. So if you go to betteratbeach.com forward slash camps, we're running three camps in the fall in Florida. That starts October 31st, seven day training camps okay? in Florida, St. Pete Beach. We have a resort. Uh, we've got a great group discount. Uh, we've got, we're going to have 12 nets set up there. It's got a beach bar. It's got food right on site and uh it's gonna be really fun so pro level coaches uh who are also pro players are going to be coaching you it's about five hours of training three days a week two and a half hours of training uh on tuesday and thursday we have three tournaments during the week so that's let me see five hours five hours five hours that's 15 and then combine so okay 20 hours of getting coached in one week plus the option to book private lessons. A lot of people book the private lessons for coaches in Florida. Um, you can jump on those. So if you got one private lesson plus the group training every day, you're talking 25 hours of coached volleyball where we will help you figure it out and we'll make you better players. Um, and all the players parties, uh, watching pros play and uh, three tournaments, group dinners. It's an awesome time. We have so much fun on our camps and I hope you guys come. The first three weeks, October 31st is the first week and it's three weeks in a row. Then you can come for one, two or three weeks if you want, and you can choose which week you want to come. We also have one directly after Christmas, December 26th, December 26th for two weeks going until January 9th. Um, and again, all in Florida, all at the Postcard Inn. We've got a great resort, and uh, we're ready to have some fun. So I hope you guys come. Uh, is anybody here watching, coming to the camp, or signed up already? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Not so many. But that's okay. I think we've got 30, 35 registrations so far. Um, so that's exciting. And uh, we're trying to cap each camp at 60 uh, to make sure that we're not overloading ourselves. I don't want to go with like a hundred people and be completely caught with a bunch of unique problems. So um, betteratbeach.com forward slash camps. If you guys want to come to Florida this year, and if you want to get on that email list so that you know when we go to a new place, definitely jump on that email list at betterbeach.com forward slash camps. Uh, if you want to join my online coaching program where we have two live meetings a week, plus uh, nine, 
10 different volleyball courses, serve, receive masterclass, how to set in beach volleyball, 30 day course, fix your arm swing in 21 days, side out and win tournaments, which is our attacking masterclass. Uh, the serving aces and accuracy. That's another 30 days and, uh, ultimate defender and then blocking and peeling. Plus that comes with our 60 day max vertical program. And it comes with 55 full practice plans, uh, with video so that you can see all of the drills that you need to do. It's not just a written explanation, but it's a video. So 50 full practice plans also comes with that. And, um, it's all contained within that membership at betterbeach.com forward slash coaching. Guys, I hope you got a lot out of this session and um, I hope to see you guys at the camp. And yeah, I love San Diego. I'll definitely come down there. So that's it, guys. Thank you for joining. And uh, if you have any questions about any of the programs, just go ahead and DM me and I'll, uh, I'll answer them. And if you want to come to a camp, Bring it on, betterbeach.com forward slash camp. It's so much fun. That's why like, I, I get excited about it. All right. Till next time. Later.